Thank you for that song. We are going to be back in Mark 10 this morning. Lord willing, we're going to wrap up Mark chapter 10 today. Mark 10, the last few verses, verses 46 through 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. It's been a lot of good stuff in Mark chapter 10. We've, 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 we've talked about a lot of different things, and uh, this passage here is a good passage too. This is, this is a passage that, it's one of those that you read and, it, and, and you instantly get something from it. You instantly can get some encouragement and reassurance and, and, and be reminded of the power of Jesus and, and what he came to do uh, and how he came to save people and the result that many people or the response, I should say, that many people had to the healing of Jesus. And that's what we see uh, with the story of Bartimaeus here this morning. But there, there is other things that we can learn from this passage that may not be obvious to us. And there may be, as many of the passages we looked at in the last few weeks, things that maybe we've seen and haven't really thought much about, or maybe don't understand uh, why, why things are, are stated the way they are, or maybe we just haven't ever thought about it. And we'll talk about one or two of those things this morning. Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verse 46. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. Many people told him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, Have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, Have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Then Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you? Rabbi, the blind man told him, I want to see. Go your way, Jesus told him. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he could see and began to follow him on the road. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and I thank you for these good words. And I pray, God, that we would learn something from blind Bartimaeus here. God, that we would follow his example, that we would recognize who the Messiah is. God, that we can recognize that we need healing in our lives. And it's only Jesus who can heal us. And so, God, I pray that we see that truth in your word today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me as I preach to your people. And God, I pray that your word would speak to each one of us in this room. God, we all need to hear it, and I pray that we grow in it. And I pray that you hide me behind the cross and let the Holy Spirit guide me as I preach and teach this morning. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Now this story is a beautiful story because, because we could really break it down and, and say, look, there's a good application here and what's represented with this story of blind Bartimaeus. At its core, what we see is a man in need of healing who recognizes that it is only Jesus who can bring that healing. A man who, once he is healed, becomes a follower and eagerly follows behind Jesus on his journey. And what a beautiful story that is, to see one who recognizes that they need healing, to see Jesus who comes to the man and says, you are healed. It is by your faith that you are healed. Now, this is a theme that we see constantly throughout the ministry of Jesus, that when people come to him, it is their faith that brings healing in their life. And that's the, the, the same that's true for you and I. Now, I'm not speaking necessarily of a physical ailment, not that God doesn't heal those things in us. He does. But, but I think that there's a bigger picture here. There's a, a spiritual healing that we need, that healing from sin, the consequences of sin that we talked about last week, that, that, that death enters into our life. And there's a spiritual healing that needs to take place. And that healing comes by faith and faith alone in Christ Jesus. And we see that spelled out for us here very simply in this story of blind Bartimaeus. Now, Jesus and the disciples at this point in, the, in his ministry, they are on the way to Jerusalem. As we've seen over the last couple of chapters, <coughs> excuse me, 
Jesus has been telling his disciples pretty plainly what's going to happen, that he's going to go to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, those who are against him are going to come against him, and he's going to give his life on a cross, that he's, his life is going to be uh, taken or given, we should say, uh, uh, for the forgiveness of our sins, but he is going to be resurrected. And Jesus had spelled that out pretty clearly for his disciples. And so what we saw in the last passage we looked at is that Jesus is really hammering home this point you guys need to be servants. If you're going to follow me, you are to be uh, focused on being a servant to Jesus and to other people. And that's the point that Jesus was really hammering home as his ministry and his time with the disciples was drawing short. And now they are continuing along their way, as we see with many of these stories in Scripture. It kind of skips from one story to the next. They're at one place, and they're on their way to the next place, and these different these different uh, things occur. And in this situation, they are uh, they are uh, approaching and and have come to Jericho. Now, obviously, the story of Jesus and the and the tales of Jesus and the word of what he has done has traveled. And as they arrive in Jericho, we are introduced to this guy by the name of Bartimaeus. Now, this is a, an opportunity to maybe point out something that I don't know that we've talked about much in the past as to why there may be differences in some of these gospel accounts. We've pointed out a few of these differences. But there's, there's one reason why some of the language and things that are mentioned, let's say, in Matthew's account are different than what's mentioned or how it's mentioned in Mark's account. Now, in Mark's account here, we see the name Bartimaeus, but right after that in your Bible, it says the son of Timaeus. Now, when we see Bar in front of a name in Scripture, even Jesus once said to uh, Simon, he said, Simon Bar Jonah. What that means is Simon, son of Jonah. This was Jewish language that Jewish people would have known. Now, when we see the book of Matthew, Matthew was probably writing to a Jewish audience. It's almost certain that he was. And so there are certain things that Jewish people knew that there may not have needed to be an explanation for, which is why Matthew may say or not say some things that Mark may say or not say. Now, if Mark would have been writing to a Jewish audience here, he wouldn't have had to say Bartimaeus and then say, which means son of Timaeus. A Jewish audience would have known that. But Mark was writing to a Gentile audience. So therefore, the explanations that he used for things that Jewish people might have known would have had to have been different so that they could understand. And that's probably why Mark put in here not just the name Bartimaeus, but followed up by saying the son of Timaeus. Now, uh, the fact that he even mentioned the name Bartimaeus may mean that this audience that, that, that Mark is writing to may know this family. They may know of Bartimaeus, even though this writing would have took place years later. Uh, perhaps it's that Mark thinks that his audience is going to know who Bartimaeus is or be familiar with the situation which is why he names the man by name. We see other accounts in Scripture where blind men are mentioned, and we may not have their name. Uh, but in Mark's account, we see that Bartimaeus is called out by name. Now, in Matthew's account, it says that there are two blind men. Uh, this is not a contradiction. Uh, if there was one, then there was definitely two. It just so happened that Mark chose to focus on Bartimaeus and chose to uh, call him out by name for some reason. And that reason may very well be that his audience would have known who Bartimaeus was and are known who Timaeus was, which is why uh, Mark made sure to put in there, hey, Bartimaeus was the son of Timaeus, something that his, uh, his Gentile audience may not have known by just hearing the name Bartimaeus. And so we see that Bartimaeus was a blind beggar, and he was sitting by the road. Now, you can imagine uh, how difficult things must have been, especially in those days. Now, I know with modern technology, praise the Lord, 
Uh, even if you are blind, there are many, many things that can help you along your way. Uh, even navigating a city nowadays is not difficult. There are certain, certain things you can do and certain, certain uh, sound things around the city that let you know when you're approaching busy traffic and, and things like that. There are lots of things that are there to help blind people. Even smartphones nowadays are made in such a way that you can navigate them by voice even if you can't see. And praise the Lord for all of the modern technologies and that uh, even in this day and age, being blind, you still can live a somewhat normal life and even work a job. But it was probably a lot more difficult in the days of Bartimaeus. And probably his source of income, his source of living was sitting by the roadside and begging for money, begging for food. And so he was doing what he always had done. And then he heard that Jesus was coming onto the scene. And when he hears that Jesus is coming by, his reaction is one of excitement. He knows that Jesus is coming and he says, Jesus, son of David, now, this is a term that we don't see too often in Scripture, and maybe it's something that you just kind of pass over and you don't really think much about, but there is, there is some significance to this term, son of David, and we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, that this morning. I feel like it's important for us to recognize and realize why this name is used sometime for Jesus and why it is probably significant that Bartimaeus choose, chose to refer to Jesus as the son of David. Now, it seems to me, and this may not be the case, but, but I believe that Bartimaeus probably had some understanding of what we would call the Old Testament. And I think that there are a couple of clues that, 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 that would, would support that view. Now, it could be that Bartimaeus simply was a blind man and he had heard the stories of Jesus and he said, look, this man can heal me. And he might have heard the stories and regardless if he knew anything of the Old Testament scripture, he might have just said, look, I believe this guy can do it because I've heard the stories. That could be the case. But based on some of the things that Bartimaeus says, there is evidence there to support that perhaps he had some knowledge of the Messiah. And so when he heard of the Messiah, he knew that Jesus was the one that was talked about. Now, in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, we have a prophecy of the Messiah that is to come. And it says, the eyes of, then the bl eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy for water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Now this sums up uh, what Jesus did uh, pretty closely. That's exactly what he did. He brought all of these types of healings when he came onto the scene. He was the living water that came onto the scene. And all this language that we see in Isaiah was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Even Jesus himself uh, in Luke chapter 7, I believe, verse 22, when, when some of John's disciples came to him, Jesus said, look, go back and tell John this, that the blind are seeing, the deaf hear. And Jesus was no doubt referring to this passage in Isaiah, this passage that was prophesying the Messiah to come, and Jesus was giving the clue that I am that Messiah. Now, for people who were observant and who knew the Old Testament and who knew the prophecy, when they began to see Jesus do these types of things, they probably said, Aha, this is it. This is the one who is being talked about. This is the one who is to come. Now, whether or not Bartimaeus realized that completely, whether he understood that and viewed Jesus in that way, we have no way of knowing. But he could have. He could have known Look, this is the one, the one who, when the Messiah was going to come, was going to make blind man see. And obviously, Bartimaeus believed Jesus was the Messiah, and he was blind and wanted to see. And so when Jesus approaches, he doesn't just say, hey, Jesus, hey, you that everybody's talking about. He doesn't just say, uh, come here and help me. Uh, I, I need some help. But instead, he calls Jesus by a, I guess we can say, a rare name in Scripture. It doesn't appear that often. He says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, the fact that Bartimaeus referred to Jesus as the Son of David is a pretty good indicator that he recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, this term, Son of David, was one that we 
see explained for us pretty clearly in the New Testament. It's something that we may not pick up from, from the, the, the first reference, which is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. If you want to turn there, you can. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. This phrase, son of David, comes from this, this, this passage here. This is where this idea of the Messiah being a descendant of David comes from. Now, this may not be something that we would pick up on clearly if it were not for the New Testament explaining this prophecy and explaining the fact that Jesus is the son of David and how he is the son of David. Because in the context, when we read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, we may think, well, this is talking about Solomon. And in some way, it is speaking of Solomon. But I think God had a bigger picture in mind even when he revealed this to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, we won't go through all of 2 Samuel 7 this morning for time purposes, but I would encourage you to go back and read it and pay attention to the language that God is using as he's speaking this message uh, through the prophet Nathan to David and the language that he's talking about. Now, what God is speaking about here is, is a house that, that, that he's saying, look, David, you are not going to build a house for me. Now, there would be a house that would later be built uh, uh, by David's descendant, Solomon. The temple would be built. David wouldn't do that. But the language that God uses when he speaks about this house being built seems to be more symbolic language as he's, as he's, as he's revealing this to David. I'm not saying that it's not applicable to the temple that Solomon built. It, of course, is. But I think God was, was using language in a way to point us to a bigger picture because he even tells David, look, I'm not, I'm not looking for a house. If I ever ask you to build a house for me, and the scripture tells us that God does not dwell in houses built by human hands, and that's spelled out even clearer for us in the New Testament, that God dwells in us. But uh, anyway, that's off track. That's a, that's a good passage that you should read to, to kind of better understand this in 2 Samuel 7. But listen to what is said in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. It says, When your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, sometimes in Scripture, when we see the word forever, it may not always literally mean forever. But in this passage, it does mean forever. And when we see this passage, we may read about Solomon that came you know, soon after David. It was David's son. But God was pointing to a bigger picture, that his people recognized that there was a bigger picture one coming, that a descendant of David would bring in the kingdom of God and it would be established forever. And so they were looking for this Messiah. That's why we see the language of the son of David used the few times we see it in Scripture. It's because God's people were looking for this son of David, this descendant of David, to come who would establish God's kingdom. But they didn't recognize who Jesus was, many of them. And so we see this language used. We know this is prophesying about Jesus who is to come because that's kind of spelled out for us in the New Testament and, and different verses. Uh, and, and, and so that's what these people of Jesus' day were looking for. Now, some of the people that Jesus encountered, they didn't acknowledge that he was the son of David, as we will talk about later. And by not acknowledging him as the son of David, they were also not acknowledging that he was the Messiah to come. But it is significant that Bartimaeus here does recognize David, or excuse me, Jesus as the Messiah, because he refers to him as the son of David. So what Bartimaeus is saying when he says, look, son of David, he's saying the one who was prophesied about, that God's kingdom would be established through forever. You are that one. I recognize that you are the one that I have been waiting for. Son of David, Messiah, heal me. Have mercy on me. Now we see this language about Jesus being the son of David. And this is even kind of confusing language for the people of Jesus' day. But there's another passage that we need to look at to kind of help us better understand this as good as we can when we, when we see this language about David because 
language about David in the Old Testament and many of the things that David said in the Psalms were prophetic. They were things that were not just about David's life, but they were about someone bigger. They were about Jesus. And we see, thankfully, these New Testament writers explain some of the things that David has said to us and help us to see, here's what David had in, the mind, in mind when he spoke these things. He was speaking about his Lord. He was speaking about the Messiah. And one of the key verses that we need to look at in the Old Testament that we see referenced a lot in the New Testament is Psalm 110, verse 1. Now, Psalm 110, if I'm not mistaken is the most quoted Old Testament chapter in all of the New Testament. There are lots of references and quotations from Psalm 110 in the New Testament. Uh, and uh, this verse 1 of Psalm 110 is one of those passages. And this is, this is an important passage to help us kind of understand when we talk about David and the son of David and the language that David uses and how the, old, uh, the New Testament writers are trying to help 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 their hearers and their readers to understand the bigger picture that came through David's descendant, uh, a descendant of David's bloodline that was Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Psalm 110, verse 1. This is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, in most of your translations, if not all of them, you will notice the first word there when it says the Lord declared or the Lord said to my Lord. The first Lord is going to be in all caps. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you see that in your Bible, and you'll see that in a few different places, when you see Lord in all capital letters, it is referring to God. That is the word for Yahweh. That's how we know that the, the, the word Yahweh in Hebrew is being used. We translate the word Yahweh as Lord in this case. And when we see all caps Lord, that means that it is speaking of Yahweh. So the verse would read maybe more clearly for us. This is the declaration or the Lord or Yahweh said to my Lord. Now, who is the Lord that David is talking to here? There are two Lords. One Lord is saying something to the other Lord. Well, who is the other Lord? Well, the second Lord is none other than Jesus. And we see that explained for us and spelled out for us in the New Testament. Now, here was David, who the Messiah would come from that we saw in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But yet in this passage, we see David using this strange language where he says, And God said to my Lord. Well, what did God say to my Lord? Well, he said to him, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, who is sitting at the right hand of God? We talked about this a week or two ago. It is Jesus Christ. When he finished his work on the cross, the scripture says he is seated at the right hand of God. Now, what did Jesus gain when he gave his life and was resurrected? He gained victory over all enemies. And so what this verse is telling us is that God said to Jesus, I will make, uh, you will sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies your footstool. Now, David is, is, is speaking prophetically here when he's using this passage. Now, no doubt the people of Jesus' day, especially the Jewish people, they would have known the writings of David very well. And they were looking for the son of David. But not all of them were able to make the connection that Jesus was the son of David, that he was the one who was prophesied about. Now, Jesus calls out some Pharisees on this issue in Matthew chapter 22. If you want to turn there, you can. Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 through 46. Many times we see in Scripture, the Pharisees come to challenge Jesus. They always tried to get him between a rock and a hard place. They tried to ask him a question that there was no way that he could win. And boy, they thought, we can ask him this, and if he answers this, everybody's going to hate him. And if he answers that way, everybody's going to hate him. They tried to figure out a situation where they could get Jesus to say something that would, that would, that would, that would, that would 
do away with, with what Jesus was saying, that would, that would make people disregard who he was, that would somehow point out that, ha, you're not the Messiah. They didn't think he was the Messiah, and they were trying to prove he wasn't. But Jesus was so clever, and he, the things he would say would be so simple. And usually he would respond with a question for them, and a question that they couldn't answer. They were always trying to trick Jesus. And in this instance, in Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46, Jesus poses a question to them in regards to David. Matthew 22, verse 41. While the Pharisees were together, Jesus questioned them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Now, this is a pretty simple question, and they knew the answer to that. Who is the Messiah? What do you think about him? And whose son is the Messiah? And they responded, David's, they told him. He asked them, How is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord? Now, Jesus is referencing Psalm 110 1 here. And listen at the language. He said that David, when he spoke those words, was inspired by the Spirit. Now, he asked them the question, knowing that they were going to answer David, because that's what they were expecting based on what was said in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that the Messiah would come and he would be a descendant from the bloodline of David. And so when he asked whose son is the Messiah, they said David's son, not his physical son that had been living for thousands of years since David had died, but one who would come from the bloodline of David. Now they answered correctly there. They understood that part of the prophecy. They understood what was being said from 2 Samuel chapter 7 but they didn't quite understand it all the way. And so Jesus brings up Psalm 110.1, and he says, Well, how is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord? So if the one who was coming after David was to be the Messiah, how is, how is David calling him Lord before all of this ever occurred? Now, you can imagine that this was a difficult question for the Pharisees, to, to come up with an answer to. In verse 4, it said, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how then can the Messiah be his son? Now, that's a tough question for the Pharisees to answer. They couldn't figure out how that could be. If the Messiah was one who, who wasn't, even alive at the time that David was, but one who would come long after David, how in the world is David speaking to and of the Messiah who had not come yet? And so this was a question that was causing problems in their mind, that they weren't able to figure out what the answer to the question was. And in verse 46, it says, No one was able to answer him at all. And from that day, no one dared to question him anymore. Now, this, this may seem like Jesus was asking a question that there was no answer to, or he was trying to stump them, or he was trying to confuse them. But that's not at all what Jesus was trying to do. You see, they were, their mind, they were limiting themselves as to who the Messiah could be. They were simply looking for a worldly human Messiah who would come and set up a worldly kingdom and rule like the other worldly kings, this descendant of David that was to come. But what Jesus is trying to help them understand, that there's something bigger than the way they're thinking, that there is a bigger picture, that there is more to the words that David said that they were missing. Not just that the Messiah was coming from the bloodline of David, not just that it would be a Messiah who would come, but it is a Messiah who has already been, who is already here even in the time of David and before David. So Jesus is trying to get them to think and trying to get them to ponder this question so maybe they can come to the right conclusion that Jesus is more than just the son of David, more than just the, from the bloodline of David, but he is also the son of God, that he is much more than a worldly king, much more than a human king that is to come. And so when we see this language that Bartimaeus uses when he says, Son of David, have mercy on me. 
we can, we can know that Bartimaeus got it. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He understood Jesus as the one to come. Isn't that something that a blind man recognized Jesus as the son of David, but those who thought they could see and knew all the answers didn't recognize Jesus, even though they talked to him plainly? This man, he heard Jesus was walking down the road, and instantly his response was, Son of David! But these Pharisees, they were with Jesus all the time, listening to him, questioning him, and they would not acknowledge and admit that he was the son of David, that he was the Messiah. But Bartimaeus got it. He understood that David, or excuse me, that Jesus was the Messiah. Paul kind of clears this up a little bit more for us in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Paul's introduction to the book, he kind, of, he kind of hits on this theme and this idea just a little bit for us. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 reads, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and singled out from God's, for God's good news which he promised long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh. Now we get that, we understand that. That's what the, 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 the Pharisees were looking for, a descendant of the flesh, and Jesus was that. His bloodline can be traced back, back all the way to David. Uh, so Paul points out that to us. We get that. Even the Pharisees were looking for a Messiah in that way. But verse 4 says, And who has been declared to be the powerful Son of God by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness. So here Paul points out an important truth that some people had missed. They missed that connection. They were only looking for a descendant of David. And Paul says Jesus was that descendant of David, but he was also the Son of God. He was the Messiah. He's the Son of God who has the power of God because he has been resurrected from the grave. And so Paul sums up very nicely there the point that Jesus wanted those who saw him to know that he was both the descendant of David, the son of David, and the son of God. And some people got that, praise the Lord. Some people, however, did not. They missed the fact that Jesus was the son of David. But Bartimaeus did not miss that fact. Now, we see another great passage in Acts chapter 2. Again, we can't read through the whole passage today for time's sake. But, but in Acts chapter 2, Peter begins to reveal to us some of these things that David said in the Psalms. And he says, look, when David said these things, he's talking about Jesus. Now, Peter is preaching Jesus Christ and Christ crucified at the beginning of Acts. Man, they are, they are meeting some opposition. And Peter says, look, we're not going to stop preaching the gospel. We're going to preach Jesus Christ and Christ crucified. And we're going to tell you about Jesus, not just what he did here, but we're going to go all the, back to the right, way back to the writings of David because many of the people of Jesus' day, they knew the Old Testament writings of David. They were looking for a Messiah, but they weren't making that connection. And what Paul tried to do in Romans chapter 1 was help them make that connection. What Peter tries to do in Acts chapter 2 is to try to help them make that connection. And Peter begins to explain to them some things that David said. And he speaks about a passage that, where David said, look, you will not allow your Holy One to, to stay in the grave, to see decay. And what, what David was speaking of, and who David was speaking of, Peter says, was Jesus Christ, that God did not allow him to see decay, but instead he was resurrected. And Peter says, this is the one who we are preaching, the one who David, in, in, his, in his prophetic wisdom, through the Spirit of God, spoke of when he said, look, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. And, and Peter begins to, to spell out such a beautiful passage here for us in Acts chapter 2. And I hope that you will go back and read that. But we're going to look at verse 32 this morning. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 32 through 36. It says, God has resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God 
and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. Now, here we see this similar language that we saw back in Psalm 110.1, right? Where it says, God, the Lord said to my Lord, where God said to Jesus, sit at my right hand. Well, here Peter is using that same language that David used. He says, look, this Messiah we're preaching, this Jesus Christ has been resurrected and he is at the right hand of God. He's using this same language. He's trying to help the audience make the connections between what was in the Old Testament and the things that Jesus had, had preached about and what had happened with Jesus' death and resurrection. Verse 34. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now here we've looked at several passages that I believe are key in helping us to understand that when we see this, this, this passage, this phrase that Bartimaeus uses, son of David, have mercy on me. He recognizes something that you and I need to recognize. And here we see all these New Testament authors, and they're going back to Psalm 110 and 1, and they're making this connection between David's writings and between what, what Jesus did in his life and saying, look, the Messiah, Jesus, is a descendant of, of David, but he was before David. He has always been. And, and these New Testament writers are trying to help the audience make that connection that Jesus is the Messiah. And hopefully we see that when we read through Scripture because God wants us to make that connection. He wants us to know that truth, that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, we may not use the word son of David often because uh, family lineage may not be of that much important to us. We, we probably don't talk, talk about David a whole lot. We're not looking for the Messiah in the same way that the, the Jewish people of Jesus' day were because we see the Messiah uh, in, in a clearer way because we have God's word to tell us who Jesus is. We may not use the term son of David in our life often, but when we see that term used, especially here by Bartimaeus, he recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, that there was only one who could bring healing in his life, and that one was Jesus Christ, and Christ alone. Now this is a truth that I hope that none of us have missed today. I hope you have not missed that truth through God's Word, not just what we've looked at today, but through all of God's Word, that Jesus is the only one who can bring healing in our life. And as we talked about last week, because of the sinfulness in our life, we all need healing. And the Bible is clear, and Jesus is clear in this passage, that we are healed by our faith. When Bartimaeus came to Jesus, man, he was begging everybody, was saying, just shut up, just be quiet, just be quiet. And, they, and, and, and Jesus said, tell him to come in. The people said, look, he said to come, to come. And he threw off of his coat when he knew the Messiah was near, and he rushed to the Messiah, and Jesus said, what can I do for you? And he said, have mercy on me, heal me. I want to see. Now, the kingdom of God, as we saw at the beginning of Mark, has come near. When we are exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and we hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we know that Jesus is Messiah and we know that there is forgiveness of sins and no one but Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has come near. He has come near you this morning as we have read God's word. Just as he came near blind Bartimaeus. The question is, what have you done or what do you do when the kingdom of God comes near you? Have you rushed to the Messiah? Have you acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah? Or do you just sit and let him pass you by? You know what would have happened to Bartimaeus that day if he would have done nothing? He would have been blind and he would have died blind. If he would have simply let the Messiah pass him by and he would have sit there and done nothing, he would have stayed there. But he didn't. He heard the good news of the Messiah 
And as soon as he heard the Messiah was coming, he said, Son of David, have mercy on me. And David said, uh, Jesus said, come on over here. Come on over here. And he rushed to him. He threw off his coat, maybe reminiscent of what we see with Jesus' disciples. They were fishing, and Jesus said, come follow me. And they threw their nets down. They left their boat behind, and they followed Jesus. And here we see that same thing happen again. Jesus says, come on over here to me. And Bartimaeus throws his coat down. He rushes to Jesus. That's probably the only real thing of value that he had, being a blind beggar. He left it behind to go and to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, what do you want? You know, Jesus, I believe, says the same thing to us in a way. When we begin to look at our life and we begin to read God's word and we begin to see that Jesus is real to us, Jesus is asking us, in a sense, I believe, what do you want? What do you want? We want to be healed, right? We want to be forgiven. We want to have strength in our weakness. We want to have someone who is with us that will never leave us and forsake us, who has the power to help us to overcome our sin so that we can defeat our sin, so that we can overcome the death that's a consequence of our sin. And when we see Jesus, when we experience Jesus, and we know Jesus is near, we need to be like, like Bartimaeus and say, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, I want to see. I'm tired of living in darkness. I'm tired of living in blindness. God, only you can heal me. Jesus, only you can heal me. Jesus, have mercy on me. That needs to be our response to the Messiah. Even when we are followers of Jesus Christ. I believe that there are times that we need to have a similar response. Times when we are reading God's word, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, that we need to say, God, I'm struggling right now. Jesus, have mercy on me. I need you. We need to follow the example of Bartimaeus. Jesus doesn't say he did anything crazy. He just said, you're healed. Bartimaeus came to him and asked him, and he said, you're healed. And why does Jesus say he was healed? Your faith has healed you. That's what heals us. Our faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ is what heals us. It's not a bunch of hoops we have to jump through. It's not a bunch of things we have to do. It's not a checklist that we have to do as Christians. There is one thing and one thing alone that we must do, and that is to put our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, after this happened, Jesus said, go on your way. And then right after that, it says that Bartimaeus followed Jesus. He followed Jesus. Now here sometimes I think where, where, where people may mess up. We hear God's word. We know that it's true. We know that we need to be healed. We call out to Jesus, and we, we know that Jesus has worked in our life. We, we know that Jesus has forgiven us of our sins, and then we go on our own way, and we don't follow Jesus. But not Bartimaeus. When he came to Jesus, and Jesus had brought healing in his life, he followed Jesus. Christianity is not just hearing the word and believing it's true and being dunked in water and never coming to church again. That is not Christianity. Christianity is hearing the word, knowing it's true, and by faith believing it, by faith being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and following Jesus for the rest of your life. And so many times we may fail at that last most crucial part to follow Jesus. Now we can learn from Bartimaeus here. Once he was healed, he did not go on his own way, but he followed Jesus. He was a man who lived his life for Jesus. He was a man who was no longer defined as a blind beggar. Before, he was a blind beggar. People would say his name, Bartimaeus. Oh yeah, I know him. He's, he's a blind beggar. People would probably say that. But that's not what defines him anymore. That's not who he is anymore. He is no longer a blind beggar, but he is a healed follower of Jesus Christ. And we need to recognize the same thing. There may be things in our life that we still define ourselves as, even when we come to Jesus Christ. There may be things in our past that we see people and they may say, yeah, but he did this in the past and she did that in the past. That's who we are. 
or excuse me, that's who we were. But that's not who we are in Christ Jesus. We were those things, but in Christ Jesus, we are healed. We are forgiven. Bartimaeus was no longer a blind beggar. He was a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to let you know that whatever was in your past, if you follow Jesus Christ, that your past does not define who you are, but your faith in Jesus Christ defines who you are. And I hope this morning you have recognized and heard and acknowledged the same truth that Bartimaeus did, that Jesus is the Messiah and that there is healing in no one other than him. And if you've never put your faith in him, I hope today that you would do that. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for these good words. And God, I pray that we have learned something from them, that we would grow in and that we would understand the significance of Bartimaeus acknowledging that Jesus is the son of David, dear Lord. And that we would acknowledge that same truth, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is your son, dear Lord. And I pray, God, that we would recognize that it's only through Jesus that we can be healed. And God, I pray that you would help if there's anyone in this room that has never put their faith in Jesus, today they would do so. That they would come and ask for healing. And in the same way that Bartimaeus received it, God, so shall we receive it. God, by our faith. And so, God, I pray that if there is one that does not have faith in Jesus today, that they would. And, God, I pray that it, if everybody in here, maybe maybe they have put their faith in Jesus Christ. God, I don't know anybody's heart. But, but God, even for those of us who do trust Jesus, sometimes we need to be reminded of the truth that Jesus is there for us. That we are not defined by our past, but we are defined by Jesus Christ and His and his success, dear Lord, and his, and his victory by giving his life on the cross and being resurrected. So God, I pray that we would know that truth and that we would come to Jesus. God, maybe there are things in our life, things in our heart that we just need to be like Bartimaeus and say, have mercy on me. And God, that we come to you and that we seek you. And God, when we come to you to know that you will be with us. That you, will, that you will take care of us, God, because your word tells us that. And God, I pray that for those who have put their faith in Jesus this morning, I pray that they would live a life, that we would live a life, God, myself included, that we would all live a life that, that we follow you, God, that we don't just come to church on Sunday, but that we follow you Monday through Saturday and our actions and everything we do and how we interact with others, God, that we would love you with all our heart, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And God, I pray that you would help those who are yours to follow you and live in that way. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's service. To learn more about Jesus, call or text Pastor Shan at 601-657-0180 or email him at shanvn at me.com. You can also visit us at www.enterprisebaptist.church or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ebcliberty. We hope that you have been blessed by today's service.